Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. I'm really looking forward to diving into your story and finding out what you've learned along this kind of entrepreneurial journey of building GTN. To kick us off, give me just a quick 30 second intro into what you guys do at GTN. Okay, so what we're doing is that we are building a novel technology to not just make drug discovery faster, but to also make it more efficient and open up a new space of potential drugs. We're doing that by combining ideas from quantum physics, machine learning, and apply that to biochemistry, which is a unique interdisciplinary thing. So we are kind of, the way we're doing it is basically advancing the representation of chemical compounds and then building a whole stack of machine learning tools that can learn from this representation, learn to predict chemical activities, and then sample new novel chemical structures. We hope that by doing this, drug discovery won't be any more limited to what people know about drugs, but it will be more open to the whole space, like astronomically huge space of potential chemical that could become drugs. Mm, and how do you see that hopefully changing the world on a grand scale if your thesis plays out as you hope it will? Um, the way I like to think about it is like, hopefully in five years time when the technology is mature enough to actually produce novel effective chemical structures you'd see like people discovering diseases and then hopefully within a month you have a good candidate that is ready to go into preclinical and clinical stages so instead of spending five years just computationally or like virtually coming up with this candidate you'll shorten that to, to a month or two and then you're ready to go like rest of humans so the whole cycle could be shortened by at least five years. The effectiveness of the drug could be increased by at least 10x. And hopefully we'll see less diseases and less people die for diseases. Certainly uh, an endeavor that's worth uh, yeah, exploring it's, it's and achieving. Exciting, yeah. <laughs> that's for exciting, sure. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the story of how you came into entrepreneurship. So I understand that you come from an academic background, you got your PhD in machine learning, and you also were a professor. Um, at a university in Denmark, I believe. How did you pivot, which is quite a dramatic pivot from going from that position in academia to entrepreneurship? What was the story um, behind that? Um, I'm not sure like it's a big pivot. The big pivot for me was like, I, w I wasn't really expected to be a CEO. So the big pivot was like going from kind of a CTO to a CEO, but mm. like the pivot into the, the startup world wasn't really a big jump because my job at the university started to be more of like the administration. So as a professor, you don't really get to do much of like coding or like the fun research stuff, but and you get to do more of like administration and mm -hmm. fundraising and like supervising and these kind of things, which is more or less what you do in a startup. Like you have to raise funds, you have to manage people and you have like to build to build your company, there you build your research group. But the nice thing about startup is that you have to move very, very fast. Otherwise, you're basically dead. So that's, that was kind of like, I would say, the, an, the analogy between the two positions for me. Mm. So like, whether I want to do it in a more like slow, relaxed atmosphere where you can't really see the impact of what you're doing directly because basically publishing papers, getting citations, and that's more or less the measure of your productivity. Mm or whether I want to do like more or less same things but being more productive more faster and see a way bigger impact and the answer was clear for me so I moved. Mm, I want to get into the co-founding story because as you mentioned in your brief description of what you're doing at GTN it really is an interdisciplinary project of two pretty diverse fields but how did you get into the field of machine learning in the first place why did you end up going down that path? Oh, that was, that started a long time ago. That's like machine learning specifically started when I was back at my bachelor studies. So we had like five year patch. I was well, I, I'm originally Syrian, so I did a bachelor in Syria, and the program there is like five years program where you get to do computer science for three years, and then you have like two years to choose a major to to specialize in, mm -hmm. and. At my time, I don't know how it is right now, but that was like artificial intelligence, uh, software engineer. And I think networking and artificial intelligence was more, so more exciting than the, than the others two than the other two, and 
it was naturally like that. Like you, you want, if you want to explore like how the world would look like in 10 or 20 years, then mm. you have to go into artificial intelligence, even if it's not really applicable at that time. So I chose artif artificial intelligence and then I did a master in artificial intelligence and from there it was like natural to go into machine learning and AI and do like a PhD postdoc and yeah. Mm. So, so you were very conscious from that age when you were doing your undergrad that, you know, I mean, you this, see, is, yeah. this is going to change the world. Yeah, like, exactly. AI is going to yeah, change yeah. the world. You see the news and you see like robotics and computer vision. They were like very immature at the time, I would say. But, but still, they were like something that you can see that will happen in the future. It didn't happen yet. But, but still, I mean, you see like the future going that way and you won't be in, in that field. Yeah. Sure. So talk to me about how this collaboration with Vid came about then. How did you guys kind of uh, end up working together? What were the processes, the conversations that meant you decided to build something in this space together? Um, I think it's like it's basically about how EF works. So like you're put in this room with like 80 other brilliant individuals and from different perspective and different disciplines and you get to talk to all of them and see like who's the one that you personally like. So it's not just about like the idea about the background, it's just, it's also about how you personally could work together. Mm. And you, you keep talking to too many people until you, you try some of them and kind of like iterate. So that's basically how we came to work together. But then from the point that where we started to work together, we were like very, conscious about the fact that we are both coming from a very academic background mm. with no industrial experience and no market knowledge and that we had to work really hard on that before we actually develop anything technically so we just threw away all the technical knowledge not like like so we were kind of like struggling about whether we should actually make something and go sell it or mm. we should like just talk to people and figure out what they want and then and then try to implement it yeah and we were like very aware that the first approach wasn't really the, the right one and it comes basically because of our background so we moved very quickly into like just talking to people and we like we kept talking and talking to people we talked about i think about 50 or 70 like between 50 and 70 different individuals and just like people working on different verticals and trying to figure out where, where are their problems and where like our technology could fit together and make a big impact and yeah we stumbled <laughs> we stumbled across drug discovery and we started like digging and it is like hugely inefficient it was really a shock like to like just to see the numbers the, the futures expectations and how inefficient the, the whole process is and we thought we could do something that is quite disruptive with what we know and we yeah we started talking to pharma people and they didn't seem to to have encountered anything that along the lines of what we were thinking and our solution seems to be quite unique and even in that very early stage mm. we managed to get like some big names in pharma and interested so that was a clear sign for us that there is something really big that we can solve and yeah we kept moving mm. so in the initial part of that customer development process of talking to people when you obviously had sort of the beginnings of an idea but it wasn't fully formed i guess okay. how did you kind of navigate the process of saying you know of talking to customers and finding out about what they wanted when you didn't have a fully fledged solution to pitch to them what, what were the kind of um, that you so use. initially we just like reach out for advice mm -hmm. so like we are so basically pitch ourselves so like i am this person mm -hmm. i have this experience i'm looking to solve some some of your problems can you tell me about your problems and i'll try to solve them so that was that that's what that is how it started but then once we started like to narrow down the field that we're working on we started like to have a more more of like a focused email like a more focused pitch kind of like a few lines that describes in a very high level it was high level because we weren't really like we didn't know what, what it was mm. so very high level about like the technology and how we think it it can solve the problem and that seems to be effective <laughs> somehow <laughs> yeah but I think it's important to work on your like LinkedIn profile because mm. people before like connect, connect accepting the connection will, will look at it and see whether you are credible enough to have a conversation. Mm. So that that was I think something important for us as well. 
Yeah, an important little filter just to make sure that they, you know, if they're doing their background checks, then you stack up. Hmm. Tell me a little bit about the process of sort of then um, going through various cycles and iterations, because obviously, if you, you know, the idea would have evolved many times, I assume, over the course of the months that you were working on it. Were there any stages where you really did take dramatic turns either before or after the process of actually deciding to focus on that market of, of pharma? Before, like for ideation? Yes. Yeah, initially we were more focused on like application for like quantum physics, machine learning, mm. for compression of neural networks. And we kept like for more than a month just like trying to reach out to people within that space and sell them what we are thinking about a product look like. But I think like EF and especially our VP was very useful in that sense, like pushing us toward actually like, is it a big enough market? Is it the right market? Is, is there something else that you're missing? Mm-hmm. So that was like, yeah, Chris was really great in that sense. Um, so yeah, so and that's basically why we moved from like this market, like compression of machine learning, which is I would say it was, it is quite an interesting application, but the market is not as big as we want it to be. And you, you, I mean, if you, if you do like a quite deep enough market research, you, you will get that sense. Mm. So we, yeah, we, we decided to move on and keep talking to people from other verticals and yeah, we moved on. Mm. Yeah. In terms of, so if we sort of uh, go back in time a few weeks when you were on stage speaking to Reid Hoffman at the yeah. event yeah. Um, run by EF, Um, A lot of the questions that you asked were around hiring and people and culture. Um, Now I'm going to ask you about those things. So to what extent is that something that you've done already? And and sort of what have you learned about hiring and people? Yeah, we, we, we keep like constantly thinking about those things. I feel like they're really the crucial part of every startup. Because I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you raise or like the idea or the technology or whatever. If you don't have the right team to execute, you, you, you won't be there. Mm. So we're trying, we are now hiring people. We have a couple of like the ones that we are interested in and they are interested in joining us. But it's also important for us, like when we interview people to make sure that they have the right mindset, that they are in the startup in the entrepreneurial mindset mm. and they are not really expecting like big, very big salaries or like they, they are happy with working with us like small, startup where like the product is not really clear yet the ideas are not really crystallized yet and they will be part of the whole process Mm -hmm. some people get scared of these things some people get excited and you have to pick the right ones and they have to know they have to like to to kind of anticipate what's going on before they actually jump in to be part of the journey so we're trying to make sure that everything we're doing everything we are planning to do is clear from day one we're trying to share with them as much as we know about what we're building and just like answer their questions pretty honestly. And basically there are many questions that they ask that we don't have the answer for. Mm. And it is part of their job to help us find the answer. Mm. And they should know that, yeah. Are there any specific questions that you're asking them to establish whether they are people who would be comfortable in that sort of more chaotic dynamic startup environment? Um, so it's usually like you get an intuition based on how much salary they are asking for and how much they compare what you're offering with what they are getting from like big corporate or like what they expect as a budget for traveling, like for, I don't know, like the, the bonuses or these kind of things. I mean, if, if they're asking for too much, then it's basically you're not in, in the right mindset. Mm. Also like the, I would guess like the, the working style, I'd say. So like how much effort they should put in is not really like working for another very well kind of established company where you go like specific times of the day and that's it. Working in a startup is like, at least for the founders, it's been like 24 mm. seven. So they should expect that they should work harder than, when th- than what they usually do for other companies. Um, I guess it's just like, it is a super exciting journey and they get to learn a lot. It's going to be different than any other environment that they will have to work with. But yeah, I think they should be just super excited about it. That's all. 
Mm. And what about this nebulous word culture that gets thrown around so much and so yeah. few people really know what it means? What are some of the sort of concrete things that you are doing, are thinking about doing sort of within GTN to make sure that, you know, the culture is something that um, you and Vid are kind of setting from the top down and it's, uh, it's the way that you want it to be? As you scale yeah, it's it's actually quite quite tricky i think like people don't really have like a very crisp definition of culture because mm. there is none it's basically like the personality of like who not just the founder whoever like joined the team very early on and then how that reflects everything that's going on within the company whether it's like when do you show up about whether how long do you work at night whether it's like how much productive you are, what's like your your style of like being there. Mm. And it's very important that you have the right people very early on because those are the ones that shape the, the structure. I mean, we as co-founders, like for me at least, I'm not usually like there at the office all the time because I have to be somewhere else. And these people will be like taking my place in, in most of the time. So it's, it's very important to, to have the right ones. I think it's more or less like matching personality, I, I would feel like. I mean, yeah, you might like have very brilliant individuals who are like willing to join, but personality wise, they might not be the, the right fit. Mm. So you have to make sure that, yeah, you kind of like, like, like working with them. You'll be there all day with them. So you have to be happy with them. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, yeah. So, sounds like there's definitely a lot of uh, nuance involved in that process yeah. of setting it and yeah, selecting exactly. the right people who yeah. are going to... It's more of like intuition, yeah. Mm. What have you learned about yourself during this process? We've spoken a lot about the kind of the lessons that you've learned, um, you know, through GTN as a startup and the kind of um, the progress that you've made on that front. But personally, sort of what are some of the things that you've taken away from this entrepreneurial process? Hmm... It's, it's tricky I don't know I, I mean I learned a lot and I really love that I kind of like miss that very steep learning girl mm. and I feel it is super important so like whenever people are like kind of sensing that they the, the learning curve started like to to be more of a horizontal curve and they should just jump into something else so I, I learned that I really love steep curves mm. and I'll say like the other thing is that I'm really kind of like resilience. Like I didn't know that I'm I can be that tough. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm. I feel like yeah. Is that in the context of just navigating the ups and downs? Is it the specific story that you're thinking back to when you uh, think about that? Yeah. I'm, I'm more like of an introvert, so I don't like. I'm not like the kind of person who reach out to people or like mm. like talking to like hundreds of people or like. If somebody says no, then I, I would like go back to him and say, why no? So I was like, I'm all, I, I wasn't like, like that. And mm. now I'm, I feel like very comfortable doing these things. So like there's like this shift in personality, which, it, which I like. And it seems like I'm doing it pretty good as well. So it's fine. Yeah, well, like we said, I mean, it was only a couple of weeks ago that you were on stage uh, chatting with yeah. Reid Hoffman yeah. in front of, you know, hundreds of people. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's definitely going in the right direction if you're talking about that. What advice would you give to um, to female founders? Because I know it's something that sort of we think a lot about EFA and getting more female founders on board, etc. What advice, if any, would you give to them? Um, I well, to be honest, I don't really like to think about like I don't really like the discrimination between mm. females and female, like males and females. So that, like, when you want to take a decision, just take it regardless mm. because there is like fundamentally no distinctions mm. so if you want to follow your dreams if you want to like make an impact if you want to do com something don't think about yourself as a female just think about yourself as a human being who wants to do something and mm. do it I mean, yeah. yeah just simplify the frame yeah exactly i mean we, we are basically humans yeah yeah and and like when you talk about startup or like doing things or mm. like having a dream pursuing your dreams there's no no differentiation i don't mm. yeah i don't yeah i don't like talking about it as like female male things sure yeah. 
when you think back to you know before you were applying to EF or when you were thinking about applying to EF, mm. was there anything that was stopping you, um, and what helped you break through it? Uh, something that's it's, it was basically logistics. So I, it wasn't really something that's stopping me in terms mm. of like wanting to do it. It's yeah. more of like I have my daughter and my husband like in Copenhagen and like moving to London, leaving my daughter behind was like kind of. A little bit of, I wouldn't say an issue, but it's like something to think about. Sure. And how easy, what was it like to move her to like nursery and how quick we can do these things. So it's mo- it was more like practical things rather than just like fundamental things. And it turned out to be fine. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you just like have to take the first steps and the, f- the other steps will follow and things will move on and yeah, will resolve. Everything will resol- be resolved and it's fine. So your advice to anyone was sort of like who's thinking about, you know, starting a company, I think it's a common sort of thing that people will sometimes come up with is, you know, it's not the right time for whatever reason it might be oh. for sort of family purposes, etc. I mean, it you obviously never, had a unique it ne- situation. It never is. Yeah, I mean, it's, and that's like apply to everything. So like whether you want to get married, whether you want to have children, whether you want to start a startup, it's like it's always not the right time it, and it will never be. So just like. Yeah, make up your mind and take the decision and go on with it. Live with it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty great note to end on. No, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was really yeah. great chatting to you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.